very much. I also welcome our guests and I also welcome all the colleagues who are viewing our program. It's a great honor that close to 30 people are watching us at this time. As far as the scholarly profile of our speakers, speakers uh, is concerned, I should like to point out that they are very much in line with the research profile of our institute, the Institute of Advanced Study because they are not limited, their research interest is not limited to one single discipline, but what they are doing is really a combination of history, political science, anthropology, sociology, and uh, they are also making great effort to spread the news, so to say, about their research results. So running this YouTube series and in a great number of uh, scholarly and popular and uh, and popular publications, uh, they make the broader audience uh, acquainted with their research results. So just two words about how this connection, this recent connection now started. Professor Mirsivet, the director of our institute, uh, uh, rediscovered, so to say, your uh, 2014 volume of uh, academic uh, conversations about uh, interviews about trans transcultural European memory and where he was also being interviewed. And he suggested that he could work out some kind of a cooperation uh, because you are very active in this field. We are also very much interested in, uh, in uh, transcultural <laughs> European memory and European memory general, and it would be extremely interesting to speak on the one hand, as you have just mentioned about your methodological considerations, and also the substance of your of these conversations, how, what you think from the perspective of early 2022, the topics, the mentality, the attitudes of 2014 in uh, in a long-term perspective, uh, this eight years doesn't seem to be very long, but if we look at how many things have happened since then, I think uh, it is a, a series of substantial changes that you might have to consider and make us ponder about it. So thank you very much. So the floor, or more precisely the screen, is yours. And uh, as agreed, uh, we are going to listen to you for about uh, 45, 50 minutes. Then there is a question and answer uh, possibility. And you are also asked to go into the substance of the future of Europe, as Aniko said, being the main guideline of uh, this lecture series. So. Uh, Attila, just one second. I uh, uh, see Professor Mistiver oh. showing his oh, I uh, see. Yes, I do. I'm not going to give a speech. I just want to welcome Thomas and, and, and your colleague. In Tautas, I'm very glad that this is happening, and I have to apologize that it happened so that um, I'm in many obligations. So I'm not going to be able to participate permanently, but my learned colleagues like Attila and uh, Bella and Andras are much better in that field, in this field, than myself. Not to speak of Luba, the whole Baltic Russian tradition, he is here. And, and Ivana from, from Belgrade, and Amirul from Indonesia, if I remember well, etc. So, first of all, I want to thank you that your, your volume turned out very interesting. Um, I could not read the Lithuanian version, but I could I did read the, the English one. And that gave me the idea, which I shared with Attila, to go further. And thank you for accepting this. And I really think the Institute should participate in such an endeavor. Um, uh, such a project and, and be one of the engines um, uh, be, 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 be behind you or with you. Um, so I'm really um, happy and very positive about um, the common future. So very welcome, Thomas. Welcome on board and the field, please feel at home. I ask now we have a more or less imagined community as Benedict Anderson said, uh, um, see each other, but we can't um, shake hands. And we hope that it is going to change soon. So I'm sorry to interrupt. 
Thank you to Professor Ferenc. Uh, that, that volume became possible also thanks to, to you because you and, um, and uh, Jody also uh, re replied to quite a number of questions uh, and provided lengthy replies. The, the microphone, I think. Is yeah, you. yeah, yeah. I think that uh, I, I need to, to say a few words uh, why this idea origin to organize permanent uh, uh, dialogues or trialogues uh, on the free and critically on our broadcasting with Thomas. Um, uh, actually, the, the purpose uh, and uh, wh why it was important first uh, we would like to develop uh, critical uh, theory in the large sense. I would say this is not about Frankfurtian school, but, but including uh, sociological, uh, political sciences, ecological, anthropological perspectives. As well, uh, we would like to respond, uh, to be in response as a philosophers and politicians, to be in response to the current events. And I remember because I participated in many events in Ukraine and Belarus, contemporary Belarus. I mean uh, that I remember one uh, rector from uh, European Humanities uh, University, uh, Vladimir Mikhailov, who uh, tell that uh, approximately about 2002, that uh, when uh, while uh, while. Uh, they read uh, Heidegger in, interpret uh, Husserl in this time, Lukashenko took uh, the power and they didn't uh, have any uh, instruments to respond or to criticize. And uh, uh, Mikhailov criticized a uh, hermetic knowledge of philosophers who are not, uh, who always speak about citizenship but in reality, they are not uh, uh, participate. They didn't participate in uh, civic events, and uh, they are outside, like uh, meta uh, social, uh, meta social people, and uh, this is uh, very dangerous for the uh, not only for philosophers, or, uh, but as well for social scientists. The other uh, philosopher, Vladimir Matskevich. Now he is in prison, Lukashenko. He's my good friend. He's approximately about 70 years old. He published many of books and he, he was always on the, uh, uh, in the opposition to Mikhailov. And he as well uh, uh, spoke uh, very similar things that philosophers and uh, if you like uh, activists, public intellectuals, they are responsible for what's going on in your countries. And you need, need to be on your professional level in your response. It means not in the crowd, but on your professional re level or to realize your professional skill response to the uh, social and political events and to show your, uh, your activism. But unfortunately, at the end of his... Uh, uh, now he has arrested and imprisoned, uh, but I think that it's better uh, destiny than to be abroad and to read uh, Heidegger, uh, uh, you know, the hermetic uh, way in, uh, in contemporary. You know, this is uh, actually, st we start to think about that, uh, how to be, you know, in the current events, but on our professional level with our skills and not uh, to create monologue, but uh, polyphony or dialogues with some uh, people who are as well involved in the current, uh, current events and they are responsible, uh, skilled and professional and to organize open discussions, not a conclusion, not uh, to do some final conclusion, but to open, you know, the problem or to inspire people to find some uh, some ideas or to speak sometimes on very dangerous i would say uh, um, ideologically dangerous uh, topics like uh, for example the last our topic was about toxic memory of uh, central eastern europe about second world war and post-war period which is uh, still dangerous openly to discuss not only in baltic countries but in ukraine in poland uh, everywhere this is, uh, again, uh, I would say that some kind of hide, hidden 
hidden source for the uh, contemporary uh, toxic discourses, toxic uh, political discourses, and, and we would like to um, recognize what's going on together, uh, together with uh, our friends, and we're oriented more on uh, Central Eastern Europe, but including as well many of uh, former Soviet uh, countries' republics. And so we applied uh, critical theory, uh, you know, and our uh, philosophical skills to this uh, field and to organize, and we organized quite a successful project. Thank you. Thomas? Yeah. Um... Um, uh, are, are we going to be recorded? Uh, uh, the question for the organizers, because I see that the button the record is not. If you agree, if you agree only. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, perhaps uh, at first I will talk about uh, uh, the two types of uh, academic conversation genre as such. Uh, one uh, type of academic uh, conversation, I, I underline the word conversation uh, and academic conversation, not an interview, because an interview is associated with uh, journalism, and the um, journalistic approach is not uh, as conceptual as we academic uh, people um, are, because we also refer to, to books, uh, to concepts, uh, to uh, we use a uh, specific terminology. So it is more of academic conversation genre rather than an interview. So two types of this academic conversation. One type is uh, uh, to conduct it in writing. Uh, the other type is to conduct it um, uh, by making a video recording, to, uh, which is uh, today... Uh, much uh, easier thanks to technologies. We can just connect from our offices. We don't need uh, um, national television studios anymore. Um, and uh, I would like to then uh, start about the first type, uh, uh, academic conversation in writing. Um, first of all, uh, before it starts, uh, uh, you have to go through the process of selection. Uh, how to make a... a a selection of whom you want to uh, talk to and uh, how to convince um, a busy professor uh, who has uh, multiple obligations, how to convince that uh, uh, he, he would agree for you to reply to your, to your uh, questions. Um, it's, not, it's not easy at all. So sometimes uh, you receive uh, nice promises and you agree on deadlines, however, in the long run, nothing really happens. Uh, but uh, uh, there are uh, still uh, people who are uh, willing to do it. And as we know from the volume in 2014, uh, even uh, um, here, the, the host, uh, Professor Ferenc, agreed, and uh, Zygmunt Bauman agreed, which, to my great surprise, uh, so... Uh, uh, it, the volume became possible. So by making a selection to whom you want uh, uh, to conduct the conversations, I'm talking in writing, uh, first of all, you can choose someone you already know uh, um, from your uh, uh, university or from your uh, academic network. Uh, then another option is uh, someone who um, you uh, didn't know, but you just met on a conference uh, that uh, keynote speaker, whoever, left a deep impression for you. And then you uh, either during coffee break, you introduce yourself or afterwards somehow approach uh, that professor and offer uh, the ideas for the academic conversation. Um, and yet uh, another uh, possibility for selection is when you read uh, uh, someone, um, let's say, on Eurozine uh, uh, network website, uh, a very uh, vividly written uh, political social critique based uh, essay, um, and then uh, Eurozine provides um, uh, short biographies of these people, uh, some of them, like Timothy Schneider, 
uh, who is a well-known, uh, now a renowned historian based in Vienna, um, you, you can already know uh, your interests, that they match, those interests match, and you can introduce uh, yourself um, and usually you do get a, 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 resp- a response. One or another uh, reply uh, um, comes to you. Uh, and uh, uh, how, to, how to address uh, whatever selection you make, uh, uh, one of the ways I uh, use to address is that um, I uh, provide... Uh, two possibilities for publication. First uh, is translated uh, version into Lithuanian for local uh, Lithuanian magazine, uh, Kulturos Borei, uh, the Domains of Culture, which is a member of Eurozine. And Eurozine accepts then the original version uh, in English uh, with possibilities to translate into other languages. Let's say uh, once I had an academic conversation with Boris Kapustin, who is uh, Russian, uh, teaches half a year in Moscow, half a year uh, in Yale, and uh, Russians translated from English into into Russian. So, uh, and I think uh, some other languages also became available. So, uh, but uh, it uh, because it is uh, uh, impossible to approach Eurozine network, uh, Eurozine um, or Eurozine, some pronounce editors directly because they do not accept direct uh, uh, direct uh, applications. They publish only uh, selected uh, papers, articles, essays, more uh, of an essay type, uh, only from the member journals. It's about 100 European uh, the journals. They have, uh, as most of you know, uh, annual Eurozine um, uh, grand conferences um, with um, renowned keynote speakers. So uh, they, uh, so the, uh, and because Lithuanian journal Kultura Zbore is a member of Eurozine, so this is how it is possible uh, to make that bridge uh, to to Eurozine, and that's how uh, uh, some some of the conducted conversations became published uh, on Eurozine via a local uh, journal of culture, uh, cal- the domains of culture, Kultura Zbore. Um, uh, that is uh, uh, how uh, the volume in two thousand made in two thousand fourteen became bilingual because I didn't want to uh, throw out uh, the Lithuanian translated version, um, so I decided to keep both languages, English and uh, and Lithuanian, uh, uh, with the all the photos of the of the participants. Um, and the electronic version is so convenient to share. Uh, no need uh, to be uh, physically limited to uh, a published uh, version uh, in paper. Um, some uh, uh, nice things uh, develop uh, when uh, you publish the, those academic conversations. Uh, I mean friendship. Uh, not in all cases at all, but uh, um, sometimes you develop uh, uh, friendship with the person who agreed to reply to, uh, to your questions. For instance, um, uh, prof- uh, social anthropologist uh, Christian Giordano from Freiburg University, um, he uh, was a regular uh, visiting professor uh, in Kaunas. Uh, I would attend his uh, his seminars and lectures, and then he would invite me to to Freiburg for to gi- to give a talk uh, in one of his seminars. And uh, because uh, he was also in a very deep relationship with um, uh, Vilnius uh, sociologists, not only in Kaunas with the social, but also in Vilnius. Um, uh, uh, I invited him in 2014 to Vilnius Book Fair um, with the, his uh, sociologist colleagues to attend uh, uh, this uh, 
Transcultural European Memory Conversation Book uh, presentation. So Giordano, Giordano kindly agreed, and uh, uh, it was uh, also um, unpredictable at that time that um, in a few years' time, uh, when uh, once again he will come to Lithuania, unfortunately, unexpectedly, he will die. So uh, Christian Giordano, uh, who is Italian by origin, uh, got education in Germany, um, and his, uh, uh, he was teaching for many years in Switzerland, a uh, very multilingual person. He could teach also in Spanish and uh, um, a doctor of honors in, in uh, various universities uh, like uh, in Romania, Timisoara. Unfortunately, unexpectedly, on the New Year's Eve, he died in Vilnius. And uh, he was buried in Vilnius uh, um, in a very um, a cosmopolitan uh, cemetery uh, uh, where uh, he was surrounded by uh, various ethnic groups uh, of uh, uh, Vilnius uh, people from uh, earlier centuries. Uh, so uh, then you have not just friendship, but also uh, really uh, anthropological roots uh, uh, that go much beyond uh, the text. Um, sometimes destiny is uh, unpredictable. Um, uh, another friendship that I uh, developed uh, also very unexpectedly is when in 2017, Catalonians were... Uh, uh, voting uh, uh, for, for in the referendum, uh, uh, I contacted um, uh, so-called Diplocat, which is Catalonia's Diplomacy Institute, um, uh, for a possible academic conversation to make a comparison uh, between uh, Catalonia's aspirations to become independent and uh, Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian. What are the differences? What are similarities? Uh, because uh, the differences are huge. Uh, because when uh, the Baltic states wanted to get independence, then the Soviet Union was about to collapse. Um, and uh, there was a very distant future to join NATO, European Union, uh, whereas uh, Catalonia is already a European Union member. So the context is very different. And apparently for Catalonians, it's much harder to gain independence being within European Union as a democratic country, uh, unlike uh, it was for the Baltic states. Uh, so uh, when I contacted the uh, um, Catalonian Diplomacy Institute, it was um, uh, Jordi... Agramon Tarufat, who replied to me and uh, uh, provided um, answers. Well, it's not in that volume in 2014. It's another volume uh, that I have not shared, most likely. It's one of the um, uh, more new, uh, smaller projects. Um, and Jordi uh, Agramon uh, Tarufat, he, he doesn't have a PhD. He has only master's in uh, in political science and diplomacy. However, uh, it was um, uh, quite a surprise to find out uh, absolutely accidentally that his wife is Lithuanian uh, from the same district of northern Lithuania as uh, I was born and grew up. Um, and uh, then uh, it was even a larger surprise that in 2018, when... Uh, the Sweden and Latvia Estonia were celebrating 30 years jubilee of the Baltic Way when we were holding hands from Tallinn, Riga to Vilnius uh, um, uh, to commemorate the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, uh, our, uh, uh, the first unofficial occupation by the Soviet Union. Uh, in 2018, for that occasion, uh, for the 30th uh, jubilee, uh, Jordi Agramunda Rofat came to Tallinn and by foot, uh, by foot he walked uh, all the way through Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, uh, carrying Catalonian, European Union, and Lithuanian flags. 
then his wife uh, made a surprise uh, without telling him. She uh, came uh, with a group of Latvians on the, to the border of Lithuanian Latvian border to uh, to uh, to support him to, on his on his journey by foot. So uh, so unex- unexpectedly, uh, Jordi uh, Arafat became. Uh, a friend and uh, uh, somehow a p- political comrade uh, and a huge fan of the Baltic states' um, culture and um, political uh, expert. Um, so uh, these are uh, uh, the, mo- the most uh, nice experiences. Um, uh, the, the genre of academic conversation uh, as you can get the impression, is oriented towards towards the dialogue, towards uh, analyzing uh, uh, certain uh, concepts, uh, ideas. Um, and it, in 2014 volume, it was around the idea of transcultural European memory. So, of course, it's oriented uh, to the words, towards positive uh, dialogue. However, uh, I had also an experience uh, in a, uh, not in that volume, but in another volume, uh, which was published uh, uh, also as a bilingual volume uh, a little bit earlier, I think it was in 2012, uh, I had one experience when uh, in that academic conversation I had a conflict. Uh, and it was with... Um, but after the con- but the conflict also ended up in friendship, so um, because uh, we were capable of understanding. It was with uh, Boris Kapustin. That conversation is published on Eurozine, in English, uh, Lithuanian, Russian, and uh, I think some other languages. Um, uh, when I received his replies, um, uh, I noticed that the last reply was uh, worrisome. Uh, what was it all about? Uh, it had to do with uh, with the way I phrased the question. Um, I am from Lithuania, and, and so um, inevitable and somehow uh, influenced by my uh, uh, nation's uh, perspective. So I, uh, my question was, the last question to him was uh, about the May 9th, uh, 1945 Victory Day memory. And I said uh, that... F- from my perspective, from the Baltic uh, state's perspective, May 9th doesn't mean Victory Day. For us, it's occupation. Because unlike the Czechs, we didn't have um, any few uh, any day gap uh, to, to celebrate uh, victory uh, against uh, fascism and then be occupied. We were immediately occupied. So uh, for us, uh, there was no this... Uh, 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 no feeling of of, of victory uh, because instantly came uh, occupation. So and because uh, Professor Kapustin, uh, uh, by his nationality, he's Russian. Uh, of course, he has this Russian perspective. I said, uh, uh, would you agree to use hermeneutical, not hermetic, but hermeneutical interpretive approach as a method? for our uh, May 9th interpretation, which would mean that uh, I, from the Baltic state's perspective, go uh, into your Russian uh, perspective for a dialogue uh, with my will to understand why for you it is a victory, because there's so many uh, uh, dead soldiers uh, fighting against fascism, uh, and would you be able to go into our, into my perspective, my regional perspective, uh, what would be, of course, inevitably related to this toxic memory somehow, uh, but could we use fruitfully hermeneutical approach, interpretative, understanding that we have different political premises? And, uh, and then uh, we had some of the disagreements but uh, in the long run, we uh, uh, we modified, uh, we worked together on modification of uh, his last reply, and that conversation is not the first, not the second version, which is published, um, but uh, maybe say the fourth uh, version. 
And we notice that in spite of disagreements, we can we can work together as academic people. We understand uh, uh, our noble intentions. So uh, uh, that is uh, the first type of uh, academic writing in, uh, of academic conversation in writing. Another type, the second type, is that me and uh, Professor Majekis. Uh, are running uh, on uh, it was video recordings for YouTube channel, Free and Critically. Uh, we do it in three languages, English, Russian, and Lithuanian. Uh, at the moment, Lithuanian is dominant, but uh, uh, we are going to increase uh, uh, video recordings, uh, conversations in Russian and uh, English. So uh, the idea is, uh, is that, um, uh, unlike in writing, when there's a video, uh, you see the author live, and uh, you can um, modify uh, or correct or shift uh, uh, the conversation instantly. There's, uh, there's uh, uh, this uh, on the video recording, uh, when it's live, um, you see the guest uh, talking, um, uh, opening uh, his ideas or her ideas, uh, sometimes not the way you predicted and uh, you enter into live dialogue uh, or trialogue in our case because uh, this program is run uh, by me and uh, Professor Majek is uh, together with a guest. So it's at, at always at least three people who are participating and it's more like a trialogue, not a dialogue. And uh, if we look uh, into uh, this uh, theory of... Um, uh, um, Ferdinand de Saussure of structuralism, uh, Saussure had this um, uh, division of uh, long language, the, which is uh, uh, based on grammar, uh, officially accepted, and this parole uh, speech, when uh, people use colloquial language, um, the way it is spoken with the dialects, and uh, including academic people when they uh, use uh, terminology and conceptual approaches, nevertheless, in writing uh, and in speech, they, they do differ. Um, uh, and uh, I think here is this uh, privilege uh, for uh, video uh, recording is that uh, uh, you can use uh, this parole or uh, speech uh, um, uh, uh, in a live process. Uh, going back to the ancient times, uh, we have uh, in Plato's books uh, the dialogues of Socrates, but these uh, dialogues were written. Uh, and uh, uh, some of them uh, by Plato were rewritten many times. Um, and uh, here in, in on, a, on, a, on, on Zoom or, or, or other platforms on the internet, we can have a, a different experience. Um, so uh, the idea now is that uh, the author uh, or the guest is live, visible. Uh, the words then are flexible. Uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, a different type of academic conversation, different approach, uh, much easier to get uh, invited guests because people uh, uh, talk for an hour uh, and they are done. When it, but when it comes to writing, then it takes much longer and uh, there is no personal contact. So... Um, so the first type of academic conversation in writing is much harder to achieve. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, thank you very much. May, uh, maybe uh, Professor Mazaikis would like to add. Something. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would like actually to add. Uh, actually, this uh, uh, Plato and Socrates dialogues are more symbolical. Then uh, you know we are more involved in uh, Mikhail Bakhtin uh, dialogian or polyphonic uh, tradition which means uh, polyphonic that uh, there are, first of all, few uh, very important features of dialogue. First is uh, the absence of uh, authoritative power. It means that all the three or more participants are equal. 
then uh, that uh, there are some uh, few different perspectives perspectives which could compete which uh, which other could be different like in the case of uh, thomas uh, and kapustin about uh, different understanding of uh, the victory of uh, second world war for many of uh, countries it's uh, very unexpected when baltic people tells uh, how we accepted this day differently from all the europe you know and uh, then uh, not so easy to uh, to present but uh, it means that you see two at least two very different perspectives and multiple uh, perspectives it's uh, one of the uh, very important issue because uh, our purpose is not to find conclusion but uh, to find uh, maybe differences in the problem it's and it's uh, very nice it's different from scientific article in the scientific article uh, we all reach originally we were trying to defend some thesis and to uh, and, and we are working on the conclusion you know to find some conclusion and uh, this one uh, open conversations uh, i participated in many of them in uh, belarus and ukraine uh, has completely different purpose it's uh, searching uh, for the idea of searching for the uh, you know some answers you know uh, uh, what what to do in this one situation you know or how to respond to the reality without any uh, without any, if you would like, uh, um, analytical uh, analytical uh, verification, uh, analytical ver verification, we could risk uh, here, and it's nice. The other, what is important again, uh, differently from scientific articles, uh, it's uh, that uh, Thomas tell you about some uh, possibility of friendship, uh, but it's not. Uh, a special uh, purpose to find uh, friendship, but the purpose is to destroy alienation or academic alienation. And academic alienation and absent of empathy, you know, that's all, what, what's going on in, uh, if you would like, I am support a little bit of uh, Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg wrote about, uh, you know, that importance of uh, empathy, or even if you, you would like romantic love or some kind of other love, in uh, the uh, political and even academic uh, and uh, professional uh, uh, professional perspective, it means that uh, to include some emotional uh, level into the conversation in order to destroy instrumental approach, objectification, uh, objectification, and alienations, uh, which uh, ordinary happens in academic uh, conversations why academic uh, conversation uh, in academic articles why academic articles it's so alienated from the uh, political and social uh, problems of the society this is a big questions ordinary ordinary every every scientist try to answer to the relevance of the article you know or to explain why this is uh, you know, important uh, these ideas, uh, but actually uh, all these ideas are presented in the silent uh, environment, and uh, you know, without uh, without some uh, empathy and with very deep uh, level of alienation from each other. The, uh, the open and free uh, conversations uh, try to destroy or to break this uh, the alienated relationships and to build some ties uh, very it could be very different uh, ties you know in order in future to develop some other maybe maybe the other project in order to support each other in the in, in our own in our own life because it means that all these uh, conversations exist not in the empty space, but between conferences, between books, between meetings, between friendship, and between academic life world, uh, life world, and uh, Lebenswelt, academic Lebenswelt. And this academic Lebenswelt, uh, without alienation, uh, uh, should be presented uh, by in in some one way, uh, in some one way. From the other side, uh, we have we have with Thomas our own limits. You know, we we couldn't uh, discuss everything and uh, about uh, everyone, 
And it, and Thomas uh, said to you that we are, feel uh, themselves are very different from a journalist approach. First of all, we reject completely reject this, you know, uh, so-called questionnaires, uh, formal or semi-formal questionnaires with a question when some, uh, you know, expert uh, answers uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, uh, given. Uh, uh, Questions? Uh, no, it's uh, it's not uh, our way because uh, all these questions are not alive. You know, all these questions are very formal, and uh, you know, ordinary. When we, for example, as Thomas prepare to speak with some topic, we are trying to find some life intrigue, and sometimes it happens that. Uh, 90 percentage of our preparations we should, uh, you know, yeah, um, demolish. You know, that's uh, it's. Uh, we couldn't use these questions. You know why uh, this happens? Like you know, like in, in it's e- even more difficult than in jazz improvisation. Ordinary I use musical uh, concepts if you like. Polyphony means. Uh, some atonal music or uh, dodecaphonic music, you know, that you always uh, interpret. But it's more difficult than in jazz, you know. In jazz, there are some variations on the topic. We don't have variations sometimes even on topic because we. this is very spontaneous sometimes, very spontaneous reaction and action. And our response is academical, not uh, journalist. And what, what the most important for us so-called Participatory knowledge, like participatory democracy, it means participatory knowledge. Participatory knowledge means that we are responsible uh, uh, as well our our colleague, which we are asking, you know. And uh, participatory knowledge means that we share responsibility between each other. Sharing of responsibility is very important and it's different from journalists. Journalists never or, or mostly never shared responsibility, and they don't like to participate in the knowledge. They just would like to get information or to use the source of information, you know, different sources or to compare different sources in order to be objective. We don't like to be objective, if you would like. Our purpose is not to be objective. Our purpose is to present the thought, the thinking, the thought, you know, of the or, 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 of our of our colleague to present the idea, the concept. It's not about objectivity, you know. Uh, and uh, the the concept, the, the the objectivity destroys, you know, destroys uh, the conversation because we present. Uh, in this case, uh, our the colleague, our colleague will be presented as some object of the investigation. He is not object of investigation. He is equal participant of our. Triangle, you know, or uh, uh, square, uh, you know, sometimes it happens, you know. And uh, this um, uh, such kind of uh, semiotic, uh, if you like, uh, group, semiotic group, they uh, create new knowledge without any copyright, if you would like. This, uh, uh, you know, some kind of free ideas, open Artwork, as uh, Umberto Eco wrote about it, you know, open art uh, work. And uh, it, this is the pur- purpose and result of participatory knowledge uh, and sharing, uh, sharing, uh, common sharing of knowledge. It's a little bit, if you like, some anarchistic idea, you know, to create our communities, you know, of knowledge, uh, small autonomous communities of knowledge or experiences, maybe for... Fr- for short time, you know, but in any way, it's very, it's very good, uh, very good experience. It's sometimes more similar to uh, artistic performances, you know, than to the uh, uh, academic questionnaire, you know. And uh, this is sometimes this is uh, helps. Uh, uh, actually, we we met some uh, uh, obstacles. We we, we met some uh, difficulties in our way. Why it's happened? Because many of academics, when we, well, Thomas, uh, tell you, when we invite them to to participate with us in our conversations or in our project, the ordinary looks for the, this very standard academic questions, you know, that we will send them, they, they will thought, then they will prepare, you know, to defend themselves. It's defending position. It's not open position. It's in order to defend themselves. 
And this in, in this defension, def defending, and this one defending, uh, they uh, don't like to participate uh, to to create this participatory knowledge situation. Uh, and uh, actually, we need to destroy this uh, um, mis mistrust uh, or uh, absence of, of of trust to to each other. You see. It's not so easy. And you are, at the beginning, I mentioned as well that we are oriented to the uh, current topics, sometimes a little bit more historical, more conceptual, but as well current topics of... Uh,
anticipatory knowledge thing did not exist yet. Um, that came uh, very, very recently. Uh, maybe that's why his uh, 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 this contradiction a little bit, uh, because in 2014 that volume was uh, only in the written form was was published was done performed only in a written form uh, as an academic genre. So maybe that's where the uh, the contradiction may seem because of this chronological uh, event differences. Um, and uh, looking back to the experience in 2014, the very title of the book, Transcultural European Memory, um, was uh, signaling um, <clears throat> the hope and the very noble intention that Europe may build uh, very integral uh, this meta-transcultural memory, just like somehow Germany and France managed after the Second World War. But... Uh, uh, Central European countries, Visegrad countries, Baltic state countries uh, failed uh, to build a uh, common memory uh, with Russia. Uh, and today, uh, when the war is looming between Russia and Ukraine, or God forbid, between Russia and NATO, uh, when the war is looming now, we see that even uh, U Ukrainians and the Russians uh, Sla Slavic uh, Slavic nations uh, failed to uh, build common common transcultural uh, memory, and um, on the toxic memory is uh, is on the surface now. There's so much conflict uh, in the vision of how post-Soviet uh, territory should be developing. Uh, so maybe Gintotas would like to add uh, from this point of view. Yeah, but you explained uh, for Attila, first of all, that uh, you know that actually this is, is was question of genre about contradiction because uh, different genres presuppose in different uh, methods and different sort of activi activities. The second, uh, our purpose was not to build, never was to build no in 2014, no, no, uh, uh, to build some system of knowledge because uh, we are talking about some kind of configuration of ideas or composition of ideas, you know, and every time uh, this composition happens different. And then uh, we feel as well very different, if you would like, emotional reaction on the Europe in 2014 and before. And now, because what's happened in 2014, at the end of 2013, Maidan was happening, you know, in Kiev. And it was very, uh, I would say, uh, 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 very uh, significant point for the uh, some uh, territory, if you like, political territory between Ukraine, Poland, Baltic countries, where we uh, start to feel um, in not only misunderstanding or absent of common language with uh, Russian officials, but as well with some uh, Western European countries, we start to feel that we consider it that uh, political process is um, a little bit differently, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, it's it's a it's uh, some kind of tra tragedy or you know uh, no, it's uh, it means that just uh, misunderstanding or that we have uh, different perspectives and we. Uh, should to speak about the uh, different perspectives and diplomacy and languages of uh, different perspectives. This is uh, why and uh, participatory knowledge we don't uh, consider as as well, uh, not as a contradiction, but as some kind of a communicative action reality, you know, from Bakhtin to Habermas, both of them uh, thought that uh, our thinking exists not in our heads, and not, uh, you know, in on our papers, but between us in communication, that uh, the thought, it happens uh, in between us in communication. And the more open communication between us means uh, more thoughts and more uh, re relevance uh, to, the, uh, to the reality. And uh, what is important here is to present uh, openly different perspectives, even it will be 
about victory uh, 9 of uh, May or 8 of May. For us, it's the same uh, for Baltic countries, no differences between two celebrations. And uh, the second is about, uh, for example, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which we could accept uh, in Baltic countries, but many of the other countries don't like to ex accept, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this one day, and uh, what is important for us to accept this one, uh, that multiple perspectives, you know, the, the vision of multiple perspectives, because in other way, uh, this uh, to survive in this region, uh, you know, between uh, many of or multiple powers, sometimes of very aggressive powers, is impossible, you know, you need to be oriented between perspectives, and to find a, a, and hermeneutics and as well diplomacy, a, a hermeneutical diplomacy, if you would like. Uh, it means a hermeneutical diplomacy that you you okay you 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 try to understand to change, uh, uh, like Thomas say that uh, okay we could invite uh, exchange of positions. You know that's take my position and I would like to take your position and uh, let's try uh, to develop uh, to develop. Even if, even if it is uh, painful, uh, painful. And what was uh, happened in before 2014? It was very optimistic and hope, uh, a lot of hopes. And now uh, more critique, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. critique and uh, understanding that what is clear, it doesn't mean that is truth. The clearness doesn't mean truth, you know. If we're sure or sureness about our past, doesn't mean that we understand uh, what, what, what's going on. And uh, the, uh, these conversations uh, uh, between us uh, or development of network, like Ferenc uh, mentioned, that net networking of co uh, conversation, this is very, very important idea. And uh, this is why we try to develop on three languages our project with Thomas. But uh, as well, we invite uh, the other groups of people to develop similar projects and to find, uh, you know, uh, if you like, some rhizomatic uh, uh, re relationships, you know. The, this is uh, one the, uh, the only one way how to resist this uh, hegemonic ideologies and authoritarian, uh, authoritative uh, power. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.